it's um, slightly painful for me to watch myself on video and have to come up here, so bear with me. Um, so I do want to tell you about one extra thing that we are very excited about. If you didn't notice, out in our lobby on the chalk wall, we have something called Project DR Christmas, and then you'll see some plastic bins down on the floor. And um, We started this last year through Thrive Youth Ministry, our youth group here in the church. Um, we have a relationship directly with the church in Palo Alto, Dominican Republic. And it's way up on a mountain, a uh, little bit of ways from Santiago. And in this village that's there, there's one tiny little church that not only supports and helps feed the congregation of their church, but everyone in the village. Um, it's not unheard of of just some random family showing up at the pastor's house and them saying, come in, eat with us, because they basically live on do a dollar a day. And that dollar a day is not even guaranteed every day, so their income fluctuates quite a bit. And even when they have an income, their access to resources is quite limited because most of them don't have vehicles, they can't get down the mountain. And so if you can imagine living like that and wondering what their Christmas day looks like, I will tell you it does not look like what our Christmas day looks like. Um, and so what we decided to do was send them a little bit of Christmas. So we're looking for your help. What you do is you take one of the boxes out there and you can pick from one of five categories or pick them all if you'd like to take five bins. You can pick to bring Christmas to a boy, a girl, a man, or a woman, and also school supplies. Recently, the church has opened up a school there for the young children, and so they're in desperate need of school, school supplies as well. So is all you do is pick up one of those boxes, write your name down and how many boxes you'll be taking, and then you return them filled here on December 2nd. And sometime that week, Wayne, and I'm sure someone, is gonna travel and get them shipped off, get them shipped off. Uh, and then will be delivered to Palo Alto before Christmas Day so that the families in that area will have some Christmas. So I would ask you to join us. We do have sheets on there on what you can and can't put in the bins. Also, if you have any questions, are my Thrive students here? Raise your hand if you're a Thrive student. Look around. So these are our Thrive students. They're the ones helping support this. Um, so if you have questions, you can ask them or myself. But please join us in bringing Christmas to Palo Alto. I want to say a couple of things before we get going into today's message time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We, we had... We had, uh, we had demons at first service, sound and video demons. want to say to our vets, thank you so much for all of your service. Um, yeah. I honestly do believe that we are able to be in this place and worship in part because of the sacrifice of our military men and women and the veterans who uh, have served. And so uh, I know uh, there are a lot of people in this room who are vets and have been in active combat and still deal with some of that stuff, uh, but also uh, are very, very uh, sold out for Jesus. And do I need to do this? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. All right, I'll do it. So I'm really excited. Thank you, vets, for, for everything that you've done. Um, and thank you for your service. Thank you for being a part of my life uh, and a part of the life of this church. I actually really do appreciate the connection that I have with you guys. Um, also, uh, how many of you guys parked in the new parking lot today? It's pretty exciting, right? I have bad news for you, though. I went out and counted the empty spaces. We, it seems like we need to expand again, like right now, <laughs> looking at the number of empty spaces that we have. Really excited about, the, about being able to park in that, so that's a really cool thing. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to start a new series called Mirror, Mirror, and uh, it's, a, it's a series on mental health and mental uh, health awareness. Um, we're going to start next week talking about, the, talking about depression. Uh, and then the second week in the series, we're going to talk about anxiety. And then the third week in the series, we're going to have a licensed counselor here. 
and kind of do a bit of a Q&A sort of thing. The reason that I want to do this is there's a few reasons why. First of all, um, I believe that inadvertently the church has kind of turned its back on mental health issues, typically because uh, we don't always feel equipped to deal with that sort of stuff. And so um, Liverpool Christian Church is a place where people have permission to, to be in pain. This is a church where people have permission to, to not have everything all right in their life all the time. Uh, and so I want to make sure that we take stuff like this head on uh, and deal with it because it's an important part of our existence on this planet. So um, be, be coming to that. Be thinking about that over the next few weeks, these uh, topics that we're going to discuss. We can't do everything uh, involved with mental health, but we can open the door and start a dialogue about that. So I definitely, definitely want to do that. We'll start that next week. Okay. So this is our last week in a series called Shipwrecked, where we've been going through the books of First and Second Timothy, and I've kind of stuck with kind of a nautical theme the whole time, and so I'm always looking up new words to, uh, to bring to you and teach you on a regular basis here. Uh, today we're going to talk about pirates. Now, a pirate is uh, not typically known for the good things that they've done, but a pirate is known for what they've stolen, what they've taken. They're known for pillaging villages and doing all kind of terrible stuff. They're flamboyant clothing. Pirates are known for uh, getting super wasted on rum. Like that's the thing that pirates want. There's songs about it. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. Like, so pi pirates are, uh, are not necessarily known as the good guys. Now one of the words that pirates like to use is hornswoggle. You guys know that word hornswoggle? You've heard that before? To hornswoggle means to cheat or swindle someone. And so if, if, if a pirate um, gets one over on somebody, they have hornswoggled that person. If someone gets something over on them, they have been hornswoggled. And so I think, I love this word, it's fun. Let's be honest, it's a fun word to say. Uh, but it also, uh, it also can apply to where we are today because I do believe, uh, and you can choose to believe it or not believe it, but I believe that there are pirates in the world today who are seeking to hornswoggle us away from Jesus and away from faith. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I fully believe that there are pirates in our lives, and we can say pirates metaphorically at this point, but I believe that there are things, there are forces, there is stuff in our life that is seeking to bring us away from Jesus, seeking to devour our faith, seeking to ruin our lives. And so rather than us being hornswoggled, we're going to talk today about hornswoggling the pirates. I'm going to, I'm going to try and stop. I'm going to try and stop saying it. No, I'm not. I'm going to keep going. We're going to talk about getting... Uh, hornswoggle and some of these spiritual pirates. Now, I got three suggestions for you so you can keep track and time. This will take 25 minutes. Stick with me. All right? The first way that we can hornswoggle the pirates is to know God's word. To know God's word. <coughs> Second Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> you like how I do that? It's a trick. We learned that in Bible college. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17 says this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I like that word useful in that passage because uh, I don't like to keep things in my life that aren't useful. Now, raise your hand if you have that drawer in your kitchen with a bunch of bull crap in it that you're never going to use ever, right? So, right. May I, I would suggest... When you get home, pull that drawer out, walk over to the trash can, and free yourself from the calamity of that drawer, right? Take, take, it's heresy. No, no. Those things are not useful. We have a drawer, I'll be honest, I'll tell you right now, we have a drawer over there in our house, and there are two exploded Chick-fil-A packet, sauce packets in there. Did you clean that out? Well, it was there for like a year. So, ever since Chick-fil-A opened, we, and, I, and I would see it, okay, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Just close the drawer. I'm moving on. <clears throat> but I like that word useful. And so Paul is saying that God's word is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And what I think Paul means by that is that God's word is useful for me 
to teach myself, train myself, correct myself, rebuke myself. If we are not using God's word to teach ourselves, correct ourselves, train ourselves, rebuke ourselves, that's how Christians become labeled as hypocrites. Because if I'm taking God's word <coughs> and I am using it against people as a weapon, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to train you, I'm going to rebuke you, and I'm not applying that to myself, and I'm not saying God's word in love, then it becomes useful for something other than what God intended it to be for. God's word gives us the power to correct, rebuke, encourage, starting with ourselves. The Bible equips us. The Bible keeps us ready. The Bible allows for recall when we get into certain situations. On Facebook this week, I asked a question, uh, if there was some advice that you had learned when you were young or some something you took away from your youth and uh, anything that you can recall about that. And some of the advice was like, you know, don't eat yellow snow, that sort of thing. Uh, but there was also other ones. Uh, measure twice, cut once. That's a great piece of advice. Think before you speak. Um, by the way, I really try hard to do that. So sometimes if you ask me a question, like if you, if you come at me with some, some stuff, and I just go, <laughs> that's me processing what's going on and whether I should throat punch you or respond properly. I don't know. Think before you speak. That's good advice. Uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. Right? Good is the enemy of great. Get in the race and stay in the race. Now, the reason that people can recall these things is because these things uh, were committed to memory and likely these pieces of advice uh, showed up in your life in a way that you needed them, right? So some situation, somebody's flapping their gums at you and you think before you speak, right? So these, these situations have been presented in our life whereby we can recall the advice that we were given when we were, when we were young. Now, here's the rub to that. You can't recall what you don't know. If you don't know God's word, you can't recall God's word. Have you ever tried to answer a question without knowing the answer? <laughs> I want to show you a video real quick. Watch this. Have you ever had a dream that that you um, you have you you would you could you do you would you want you you could do so you you do you could you you want you want him to do you so much you could do anything. <laughs> He, he, okay, so you understand what I'm saying here. If you don't have God's word in your heart and mind, you cannot recall God's word when you need to have that as an answer. Now, if you are not a person who reads your Bible, may I suggest, may I ask, may I plead that you become a person who is reading their Bible. Now, a lot of us, we have the app on our phone or different apps where um, a verse of the day will pop up. Right? And, and that's great. I think those verse of the day things are great. Um, but I also don't think that they are enough. I don't think it's enough. Doritos is one of the best things that God has ever created. Now, let's, let's see, let, by show of hands, nacho, nacho cheese or Cool Ranch? Oh, no. No. Yeah, no, this is split 50 50. This, if, you are a, if you're the nacho cheese group, you are correct. Yes. Right? Now, <laughs> Love nacho cheese Doritos, polished off a bag yesterday, no problem, all right? So, but if you take one out of the bag and you eat one nacho cheese Dorito, it is not a meal. It does not, it does not fill you up, it does not sustain you. And so I see these verse of the day things as one beautiful, delicious Dorito that is not enough for me to be sustained by. You guys get the metaphor here, right? Yeah. And so God's word is a spiritual meal for us. It is a foundation building meal for us. And so I would suggest that you start reading the Bible. Now, you might not know where to start in the Bible. I have a suggestion for you. Not page one. <laughs> All right, don't start at the beginning. Here's my suggestion. If you open your Bible right in the middle, there's a book called Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is written as though a dad is talking to his son. Now, there's some very gender-specific stuff in there because it is a dad 
writing to his son, but I think this applies to everybody. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Whatever the day's date is, read that chapter. So today is, prob is, is <laughs> November 11th, right? Yeah. So you would read chapter 11 in Proverbs. See, even dumb guys like me can figure this one out, all right? So, and you can do that over and over and over again. I've been a proponent of reading through the book of Proverbs for 11 years now. And it's only been in like the last three or four years that I've been able to recall the stuff that I've been reading. And so this is not a process that is going to be short. This is not a microwave process. It's something for you to get into, to keep doing, and keep doing, keep doing, so that when the situations arise, you may recall God's word. That doesn't happen if you're not putting it in. All right? So start in Proverbs. If you want to move somewhere in the New Testament, I suggest the book of Mark, and you can find it in your index in the Bible. And the reason I suggest the book of Mark is because I fully believe that Mark had ADD, and so with the way he writes, he writes in very short sentences. The stories are very short. And if it's hard for you to pay attention to something that you're reading, the book of Mark is a great place for you to start. But we have to, have to, have to know God's word if we're going to hornswoggle the pirates. This is foundational for us. This is, this is the, the baseline for the things that we need in order for our faith to grow. Number two, hornswoggling the pirates means fighting for your faith, fighting for your faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. I think that's an important word there, good fight, because there are bad fights to fight. There are meaningless, pointless, um, trivial arguments and things to fight. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. What are you really willing to fight for in your life? I mean, many of us would say, my wife, my family, or anything like that, I'd fight for my husband. Some of you wives, I wouldn't scrap with you when it came to your husband. Because you're willing to fight for them. Now, I would say this, fighting for your faith is a real thing. And what, what tends to happen is that these spiritual attacks that come to us, we begin to think of them as innocuous, like, oh, it's not a real thing, or it's not a really a harmful thing, or like, Satan isn't really trying to take me out. Bull butter. He absolutely is. And if we are people of God's word, then this is one of those foundational truths that I think we need to believe. That Satan is trying to undercut us, that Satan wants to destroy us, that he wants to take us away from our families, that he wants to break up homes. And so we need to fight for our faith. You ever been in a fight with somebody, like a fist fight? Mm. Two of you are gangsters. Okay. So. <laughs> when I was young, I had a bully. His name was Earl Norton. It just sounds like a... <laughs> a terrible name. And uh, he was one of these, like, uh, head Napoleon syndrome kind of things, like, really short dude. But he would, like, steal his dad's steroids because that was a thing. And he would do, like, 100 push ups and, like, <laughs> like, he was just that guy, right? Just like, super annoying. And he was always messing with me. And I didn't have anything, in, I didn't have any spine for a while uh, to do anything back. And I was talking to my other friend one day, John Crumpler who I dated his sister, Lisa, by the way, um, in like fifth grade. <laughs> That's what you do in fifth grade. Um, and I was like, John, dude, I'm so tired of Earl messing with me. He said, you gotta stand up to him. You gotta stand up to him. I was like, all right, fine, I'll stand up to him. I said, but you got my back if it goes wrong. He's like, yeah, I got your back, don't worry. <laughs> so the day comes when, when Earl and I are to go to fisticuffs, and Earl's doing this, like he's coming up to me, and he's like, what? He's like, you know, like, he's preening. You know that, like he's making himself bigger, like you're supposed to do with elephants. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's doing all that, and he's like, she's like coming up to my chest, and he's like, oh, shoot. Sure, sure. He's like saying whatever he's gonna say. And you know what I did? I just did this. I just, this is exactly what I did. I went like this. That was it. That was all I did. And you know how it ended? It ended with him going, all right, man, we're cool, we're cool. Like, he didn't want, he didn't do anything. Because I finally stood up to fight for myself, I didn't even have to throw a knuckle at him, but he backed down. And so for me, when I'm thinking about our faith, sometimes we think this fighting for our faith is this big dramatic thing, and sometimes it's just you standing there with a spine. 
And so Paul gives some advice about fighting for your faith. He says, keep your head in all situations. That's easy. <laughs> Thanks for that great advice, Paul. But Paul did this because he had a broader perspective of life and eternity. It wasn't about the situation that was right in front of it. Paul understood, as we need to understand, that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle in this world is a spiritual battle. And so we need to keep our head in all situations with a broader perspective, an eternal perspective about what's going on, rather than just all of the nonsense that's right in front of us. He says also to endure hardship. Please note that enduring is not enjoying. Those are not the same words. You don't enjoy a hardship. My house is burning down. Yeah, like, hooray. You go through a hardship. You come out the other side of a hardship. You endure that. Paul says, finish the race. I would say this to you. Don't quit. Don't ever, ever quit. This is advice that we give to our daughters when considering that they might be attacked by someone one day. Don't ever quit fighting. You fight yourself out of that situation. And so spiritually speaking, if there's sin, if there's struggle, if there's things going on in our life, don't ever stop fighting. Finish that. Or die trying. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Finish it. The race and on the other side of that, if we are not spiritually hornswoggled, is a crown of life that Jesus has for us. See, and I believe that this is why we need to change our perspective of safety in this world. We need to have a new perspective of what safety is in this world. That's the third thing. If you want to hornswoggle the pirates, it means having the right perspective of safety. Look at this passage in 2 Timothy 4. He says, At my first offense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Have you ever felt that way? Alone, fighting alone, deserted, <coughs> stranded. But because Paul has an eternal perspective, the same one that we should be having, he says, may it not be held against them. He goes on, he says, the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. So that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. There's two ways to look at the, those words, lion's mouth. It can be figurative, and say, oh, I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Now, remember, Paul is writing this from prison. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Sounds very poetic. Or it can be interpreted literally, which I tend to do uh, with this, because at this time, Nero uh, had his games... And he was fond of throwing Christians into the ring to be eaten by lions. Not a good dude. He would also tar Christians, people who were found to be Christians, and he would impale them and he would light them on fire and use them to light his gardens at night. Okay, so this is a good dude. And this is what Paul is saying. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. I was delivered from that sort of thing. Why? Because the, store, the Lord stood at his side and gave him strength. Then he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me what? Safe. Safe. Safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We need to understand that safety in the world's eyes is not the same as safety in God's eyes. Safety in the world's eyes is not the same as safety in God's eyes. Paul says in that passage, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Paul died by the sword. Paul died by the sword. Paul did not have a safe life. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about his sufferings. He was in prison. He went through severe floggings. The Jews had a punishment called the 40 lashes. And so it was 39 lashes minus one. And it says, Paul says that he went through that five times. Five times he suffered 40 lashes minus one. He was three times beaten with rods. He was pelted with stones. He was shipwrecked literally three times. He had starvation. He was cold. And he experienced nakedness. And then he says, the Lord will bring me safely to his kingdom. Paul sounds insane. None of that is safe. 
unless safety doesn't mean what we typically think it means. Helmets, knee pads, elbow pads, cushioned lives. See, Paul's perspective of safety was not for his physical body. Paul's perspective for safety was spiritual. And so this is why I think we need to have the right perspective of safety, the proper perspective. Paul was safely enveloped in the Lord's care, and that does not mean physically safe. It means spiritually safe, resting in God's love, knowing that no matter what happens here on this earth, that we have Jesus, that someone who's given their life to Jesus has Jesus, and there is a heavenly kingdom, a crown of life waiting after this earth. This, I think, is the proper perspective for safety. This world is not the end of our story. And so uh, to me, it's much more important for us to be safe spiritually than it is that we don't get a cut on our elbow. <clears throat> Paul went through all of these things, and still he said he was safe. Why? Because he was finishing the race. Life is tough. Life is very tough. But being eternally safe with Jesus is true safety. Listen, I, I read this quote. It says, sometimes Jesus delivers us from death, and sometimes he delivers us through death to something much greater. You guys understand, that's, that means sometimes you don't die, sometimes you do die. Now, we have tremendous freedoms in this country. We have no idea, no idea what it's like to be persecuted. Maybe you're embarrassed to say something to your friend about Jesus. That's not... That's not the same persecution that Christians are suffering in China and in North Korea and in the Middle East. They're dying, literally, having their tongues cut out and their, their hands cut off because of this. But they're safe. The, the Bible is such a paradox to me. They're safe with Jesus even though they are unsafe on this earth. And so we need to have a proper perspective of safety Understanding that we're either going to hornswoggle the pirates or they're going to hornswoggle us. But it's definitely happening. Mark Batterson, an author, said this in one of his books. He said, we've got to stop living our lives as though the point were to arrive safely at death. <laughs> yeah, how many of us do that, though? <laughs> right? Can't wait to land in my cushy coffin. <laughs> it's a ridiculous statement, right? But so much of what we do is, is to protect ourselves, our physical selves. <coughs> and so this is why I think it's very, very important for us to know God's word. Because I think knowing God's word gives us that foundation for our faith, that we can build on that. I think it's important that we fight for that faith. I think it's important that we have the perspective of knowing that Jesus has our back. There's plenty of passages, and I don't know how many, uh, in the Bible where God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then other ones where he says, be strong and courageous. I like that. I like the words, be strong and courageous, because that's what I want to be. I don't want to be cowering in a corner as life happens to me. I want to be strong. I want to be courageous for Jesus. I want to take steps. I want to take action toward him. I, I fully believe, like, I'm not qualified for that. But because I'm trying to have my foundation on God's word, because I'm fighting for the things that I have, because I know that there's an eternity waiting out there, I think that Jesus offers me this grace that makes me look better than I actually am. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. I'm thankful that we can be encouraged to be strong and courageous. So that's what I want to leave you with today. Get into God's word. Fight for your faith. Understand that there is an eternity after this life. And we can be safe in the arms of Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for this time and this moment. Thank you for 
giving us this place to be in for soldiers who have fought for this freedom, for you who have died for this freedom, for this connection that we can have. I pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds, that we could see your words, that we would apply them to our life, that your useful word would actually be something that we put into our lives, that we put into practice, that you would change us, Lord, from the inside out, that you would make us into the things that you want us to be. God, even, even where we are prideful, where we are stuck on ourselves, or where we are stuck in sin, I ask, Lord, that you break us. That you break up, open our hearts, open up our eyes and our minds so we could see you and know and know without any doubt that you love us, that you're never going to leave us, that you've always got our back, and that we can be safely wrapped in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.